Hello and welcome to Spy Hard Podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, you'll never kill my dreams. And who would want to, Cam? But before we go any further, we are joined today by a very special guest emerging from the Cuban ocean. It is none other than M from the Verbal Diorama podcast. M, thank you for joining us. I see you handle your weapon well. <laughs> oh, there's going to be a few of these. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, Scott. Hi, Cam. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Hey, welcome to the show. <laughs> there's too many puns in this movie. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. Um, well, before we uh, get into it, uh, as it were, and, and talk about the film that we're covering this week. M, let's hear a little bit from you. Now, you, of course, run the Verbal Diorama podcast where you talk about films every week. But as a guest, we want to know a little bit more about your spy background. Okay. So could you tell us your favourite spy film? Oh, I can only choose one. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. It's a desert island disc type situation. You've only got the okay. one. Okay. Um... Oh man, this is really, really hard. <laughs> Let, um, I know, like, no pressure. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. The the spy genre as a whole um, is is not something that I am very well kind of interested with. Um, mainly because, and I'll, I'll be completely honest, I would make a really terrible spy because I I don't have a poker face, and I can't lie. So if I was, oh, and, and obviously I don't like to be tortured and, you know, I especially don't like the scorpion venom. It's really bad. It's bad for your skin, scorpion venom. It's not, not nice at all. But <laughs> yeah, I would make such an awful spy. And I guess spy movies that I really love, I, I guess I'd kind of go to one of the ones that I've featured. Um, and... I'd, I'd tell you what it would be between. It would probably be between Atomic Blonde and probably The Long Kiss Goodnight because they're both kind of these really... Well, obviously, they're female-fronted for a start and, and I'm always sure. a big fan of female-fronted. I also love Charlie's Angels. <laughs> Charlie's Angels is, is like covers the camp for me. Mm -hmm. sure. and, um, and The Long Kiss Goodnight is just, just crazy batshit action kind of thing that, that I really, really love. Um, and then Atomic Blonde is, is just this gritty, realistic... I mean, what Charlize Theron does in that movie, I mean, she's incredible. She She's everything. She's a goddess. And, um, yeah, if, if you were forcing me at gunpoint under torturous circumstances, a bit like what James Bond has to go through at the start of this movie, you know, waterboarding, all of that stuff... Just to get the answer out of me, then, <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming that's not going to happen, by the way. I'm assuming that you don't have like an ice bucket full of water <laughs> and you're not going to be like dunking my head in um, because that's not what you I signed up for. You can assume whatever you want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you were kind of forcing me to choose, I'd probably go for Atomic Blonde. Okay. That's, I mean, it's a really interesting movie that I'm looking forward to delving into in the future. We talked about Long Kiss Goodnight on the podcast and really enjoyed revisiting that, so... Uh, yeah, fingers crossed Atomic Blonde delivers when we do the revisit. Yeah, oh, I, oh well, I think it will. I think, I think it absolutely will. And, and obviously there's a little bit of John Wick in there and I have to get Keanu in at some point. I was waiting so, for it. I was waiting uh... for a Keanu reference. <laughs> we're we're going to cover the yeah, John Wick so at some point. So. Yeah, well, and absolutely you should. And, and absolutely you know who to get involved mm. with that. Um, but yeah. I I think Atomic Blonde is I mean it didn't it didn't do particularly well and uh, it definitely deserved to do a lot better uh, than it than it ultimately. I remember did, really so. enjoying it. I, yeah. I, it's a shame it didn't do better, um, you know, in terms of returns. But moving on from there, now as I mentioned before, Verbal Diorama is your podcast. Tell the listeners a little bit about what you do. Well, I mean, I'll be, I'll be completely honest. I probably should script this <laughs> for for when people ask me what is Verbal Diorama, hmm. but. I'm just going to have to make it up on the fly, really. Um, so Verbal Diorama, it's basically 
um, a podcast all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. I am a big fan of the history of movies, kind of how they come to be, production stories. Um, I love trivia. Like Ever since I was a little kid, I've loved bits of information about how things are made. And I'm just so fascinated with how a movie kind of, the idea all the way through to completion, irregardless of how the movie actually turns out. Um, no one sets out to make a bad movie. Um, and I think that retrospectively, a lot of movies are better than a lot of people give them credit for. Um, some of the things that I like to focus, I love to focus on, well, I love to, I love to focus on animation. Um, I, I, I've always adored animation ever since I was little. And I think animation can tell a story unlike live action in so many ways. And I love practical effects. It's kind of a bit like light hand on animation. It's a bit of a dying art. And practical effects will always age better than um, CGI, as you as we can see with something, you know, just recently, Jurassic Park celebrated its mm. anniversary, Raiders of the Lost Ark, as we're recording today, is celebrating its 40th anniversary. And how fantastic do those films still look because of practical effects? So, um, and I also like to champion movies that, you know, maybe people didn't really like very much and didn't do very well. Um, and I like to basically look into them and, and basically say why we should love these movies and how fantastic they are just for the fact of how they were actually made and the things that went into these movies, movies like Willow and movies like John Carter. And, you know, the fact that, yes, these movies, you could argue, yeah, they're not perfect, but not, not much is perfect. Uh, and the movie that we're talking about, I think, is a great example of a movie full of CGI uh, <laughs> uh, that foregoes all of the practical effects it possibly can. Um, and that isn't definitely is not perfect, but I do think has redeeming features. Yeah. OK, that's going to be, I think, a uh, good segue <laughs> into the movie. Right, Scott? Well, I, I think I do have one more question, actually, that might set up uh, M's stance on James Bond. Uh, OK. Because... I know some information and, uh, you know, the question is, Em, how many Bond films have you seen? Oh, God. Um, okay. And this this isn't a put you on the spot, make you feel bad kind of thing, okay. because I have a reason I'm asking this question. And I, I think it's actually for the better. Okay. Uh, so I'll be completely honest. Um, I don't own that many Bond films on, like, DVD or Blu-ray. Die Another Day... I think is the second <laughs> Bond movie uh, that I own. Uh, the other one is Casino Royale. So sure. um, when it comes to actually watching Bond, I mean, obviously, uh, growing up in the UK, James Bond, Bond movies were always on the TV. You know, every Saturday, you'd switch on ITV and there'd be a Bond movie on in the afternoon. So I would always grow up watching bits of Bond movies. Um, you know, the, the ones from like the 60s and 70s, the, the Sean Connery, the, the Roger Moore kind of bonds. But it was only ever like bits and pieces. It was never, oh, I'll sit and watch a full movie because I was a kid. Well, why would I do that when I can play outside and be a normal child and do normal child things like read encyclopedias front to back? Because that's the weird stuff that I did as a child. Um, so when it comes to actually cinematic bond, it wasn't really something that I can say, <laughs> in all honesty, that I have a great deal of experience in. And it's, <laughs> and it's like, when it came to coming on this podcast and we talked a little bit about the topic for me to come on, and I know we threw a, a couple of movies back and forth, um, and obviously it was originally going to be something else. I'm not going to obviously say what that was, but something completely different to Bond. And... And then when you suggested Bond, I was a little bit like, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Um, and then when you suggested Die Another Day, <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, to, to be perfectly honest, I, I was quite intrigued because it is a movie that I definitely have seen before because I definitely remember certain key scenes of the movie for mostly the worst. But the Pierce Brosnan kind of era is probably... So Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig eras are probably the eras that I've seen the most because I've definitely seen, um, I was going to call it Goldmember. <laughs> That's not even the right franchise. Goldeneye, I mean. 
I've definitely seen GoldenEye. I've definitely seen Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, I've definitely seen The World Is Not Enough. And I've definitely seen Die Another Day. And then obviously all the Daniel Craig Bonds. I saw most of those at the cinema, actually. Yeah. So really, mod- modern Bond is, is the Bond that I've kind of seen the most. Uh, I've seen bits of older Bond. But I couldn't, like, I couldn't tell you the plot of Octopussy. Neither could I. I. Yeah, few, few like, could, well... few could. <laughs> but I, I... It's just like there's a there's a woman. Her name's Octopussy. I don't I mean that's it. But, I mean the reason I ask is because if you look at the who we've had on as guests so far for our Brosnan Bonds, we the first guest we had was uh, was Janine Smith, Cam's sister. Uh, for Tomorrow Never Dies. And then we followed it up with Dr. Lisa Funnel for The World Is Not Enough. And she's the Bond doctor. She basically wrote the book on Bond. Okay. Now, I wanted mm. to... So we've had... So that's two people that are very engrossed in the Bond universe. And they have varying opinions on Brosnan. And what I wanted for the follow-up was someone who's well-versed on cinema. Someone with no experience. Well, yes. <laughs> well-versed on cinema. <laughs> You know, you know, you love movies. You do a podcast about movies. And so I thought, yeah. I want someone who loves film to come and look at this film. Are you, are you setting me up for failure? <laughs> in, this, in this cinematic, so you're basically going through all these Brosnan Bonds and you're choosing guests that are really knowledgeable in Bond and they know so much about Bond. And then we get to die another day. And then every, everyone listening is going to be like, this random person literally knows nothing about James Bond. Well, you see, this is it. Because me and Cam can cover the the knowledge and the in-jokes. But there's always a question of, does this work as a film? And sometimes... I, I, mean, I can give you a rough answer well, now. But... Uh, you know, maybe hold that for a minute. But, you know, okay. I, I think it's good to look at these films also as just a piece of cinema. And if you just rely on the sort of... Because this is meant to have been the 20th anniversary, the 20th film, it was, I think it was the 40th anniversary of mm-hmm. James Bond. It was a big deal when it came out, uh, which yeah, is getting into the background, which Cam will deal with in a minute. But I wanted someone who was fresh to look at this film. And that's why I thought you were a good guest. But uh, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I really hope I don't disappoint. Because um, that would look really bad on me, wouldn't it? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know... It... No, no, it'll, it'll look bad on yeah. Skype. Yeah, I, okay. I've just set yeah, this up. Yeah, he chose the guest. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I think we've uh, definitely given it away now, Cam, but uh, just in case, what are we doing this week? Well, Scott, we're talking about 2002's Die Another Day. Sigmund Freud, analyze this. <laughs> <laughs> analyze this. Analyze this. That's my outro line. Thanks, everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah, well... Yeah, so before we dig into it any deeper, let me read you the letterbox.com synopsis, and it might be one of my favourites. Die another day. He's never been cooler. Bond takes on a North Korean leader who undergoes DNA replacement surgery that allows him to assume different identities. American agent Jinx Johnson assists Bond in his attempt to thwart the villain's plan to exploit a satellite that is powered by solar energy. Some spoilers in there, for sure. Yeah, I I just like the tagline, he's never been cooler. That was, I don't think that oh, was the course. tagline. I don't think that was the tagline on the posters, was it? I don't have any memories of that. Um, maybe they were on a couple promos, but weird. It, it's... But he has never been cooler. That, that is actually true. quite clever. Yeah, um, I guess so. I mean, it definitely plays into the whole, like, dad joke, dad brosnan bond thing yeah Um, yeah yeah but um before we get into the background uh, i want to talk about initial reactions to when this first came out now em i know you've basically just watched it for us but um were you aware of this film in the background had you seen you said you've seen bits of it would you were you aware of its legacy oh absolutely um i mean (laughs) it's kind of my job Uh, (laughs) but um yeah, no, I, I absolutely, uh, I, I, and I'm pretty certain I have seen this whole film uh, because I, I, I definitely do remember it. Um, and, and I think the legacy of this movie is actually incredibly important when it comes to modern Bond. Yep. And I think a lot of people forget that, that without this movie being so average, <laughs> and in, in some ways bad, in some ways decent, 
um, we we wouldn't have the the modern Bond that everyone loves so much in Daniel Craig. So people forget that 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 sometimes a a movie that I mean because this movie did incredibly well at the box office as well. I believe it was uh, it was the highest uh, grossing James Bond movie. Uh, I think up to that point, I, I don't know exactly um, because I don't have figures in front of me. But it was an incredibly successful financially financially successful I should say movie um so the fact it wasn't very good um actually really shaped James Bond whoa 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 uh, very a, good it wasn't very good this is the best film I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> I mean of, of, were we watching the same thing probably, uh, probably not um <laughs> were you watching the Austin Powers version <laughs> 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 that probably would be better. Um, but yeah, the, the legacy of this movie is immeasurable, hmm. really, in many ways. Cam, do you have any memories of this film? I do. I was really tracking the production on this one back in the day through things like Cinescape magazine and rumors printed in my local newspaper. Um, I, I remember, you know, there's a lot of rumors it was going to be called Beyond the Ice. And so I was really excited. Oh my God, what's Beyond the Ice going to be like? There was rumors of Catherine Zeta-Jones being the co-star. Um, I don't know how much of that was actually accurate. When I went to do my research, a lot of this stuff just seemed like it was a rumor at the time. But back then, rumors really did pick up steam and wound up at least in my head. And so this was one of the movies I was the most excited about. And I remember going to it uh, opening night with my friend Mark. And Mark was more of a casual Bond guy. He'd seen them all mostly just thanks to me. I'd forced him to watch all of them. But I remember sitting through it, and I tend to find when I see Bond movies, it's rare that I walk out um, unhappy. Like, I may have quibbles. I may walk out being like, hmm, that one needs to be rewatched. I'm not sure about its place yet within the canon because... The Bond movies have such a vast canon that I never really know as I'm watching it in the immediate experience where it kind of fits in, how I feel about it, because Bond is such a trend-hopping franchise that it's ridiculous to sit through the movie and be like, well, I don't like this one because it was ripping off this or that. Every Bond movie is like ripping off this or that, like beginning from the 70s onwards. Mm -hmm. So I remember sitting there and a lot of the effects stuff going, oof, don't don't care for that. Um, I remember my friend Mark turning to me at one point and saying, why is everyone talking so weird? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it is a little arch in a lot of the dialogue in a way that I don't feel was the case in the last few. But I also remember walking out being like, well, it had a lot of action. Um, it had a lot of great locations. I guess it was all right. But it also wasn't one that I walked out excited the way I did with Tomorrow Never Dies or Goldeneye. It was just like, yeah, that was, I think, okay. Um... You know, like, I don't know that I had a radically different reaction walking out of this one than I did World Is Not Enough, for example. Um, it was more like once, you know, the rewatches and the years with the movie kind of sat that I figured out exactly where I kind of slotted it in and my ultimate take on the movie. Mine was slightly different in the sense that I was... I'd definitely seen The World Is Not Enough at the cinema. And I remember going as a family to see Die Another Day. I remember there being a lot of press here in the UK for it, especially when they were filming around Buckingham Palace, uh, all that sort of stuff. Same with when they filmed by the O2 for World is Not Enough. But um, I remember going to cinema, and it was one of my first experiences walking out of a film and being like, I don't think this was very good. Mm. And at 15, I didn't have that sort of mind to really understand what I didn't like about films. I just remember walking out of it and as a family agreeing that it just wasn't that great and being disappointed by it. And I hadn't watched it since until now. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And that's not because like, well, yeah, I, it was just, you know, I felt like it left such a weird taste in my mouth. I didn't really want to revisit it and it'd be even worse. Wow. Okay, so... I mean, it, it, huh. It's it's the movie that doesn't age well in many respects. Um, so I, I can imagine what if you watched this movie, you know, when it first came out and then you were only re-watching it again now, there is quite a lot of it that really does not hold up. Uh, and I'm not just talking about effects. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the effects, I remember even at the time kind of groaning about those. But the fact was, mm. if you were watching a blockbuster in the early 2000s, late 90s, 
they were filled with terrible effects. You know, you were watching like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the day after tomorrow. Uh, was it? Yeah, that was the the movie. The day after tomorrow with Dennis Quaid and Jake Gyllenhaal, where you had like the really fake looking wolves. You had the Mummy Returns, which was filled with all sorts of cartoons. Like you were just used to going to movies. And I remember my friends and I walking out of almost all of them being like, "Yeah, the effects were horrible in that." Um, Matrix Reloaded with the big burly brawl. First Harry Potter with the Quidditch stuff. It was just like filled with terrible CG. So. While watching this movie now, you know, last night, it's glaring. At the time, it was just like, yep, this is just a trend now. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. It it was a definite uh, trend, sort of late 90s, early 2000s. And, and that's one of the notes that I actually made about this movie, is it it does feel very 2000s. Like, yeah, that's, it just encompasses everything about early 2000s movies, really, in one movie. <laughs> it has everything early 2000s. With a lot of the Bond films, much as you can tell they were filmed in certain eras because of just the way things look, they do have a timeless feel to them. And I, I'm not sure this one does, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. The only other part of my memory of this film is my family still use this against me because I, as a kid, I, mean, I have four brothers and we would all pick films to go and see at the cinema from time to time. And there's two picks that they will always hold against me. This is one of them. And the other one, which I'll mention later, I actually think ties into this film quite well. Um, and since then, they won't trust me for any cinema advice whatsoever. <laughs> I don't think Mark will ever trust me for cinema advice after dragging him to this. So, <laughs> huh. yeah. I, mean, I well... find that a bit harsh, though, because, you know, you can't be held responsible for something that you <laughs> you wanted to do when you were 15. Um, I mean, tell that to my parents, case, Em. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had terrible, terrible uh, choice and decisions. Uh, choice. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, uh, terrible taste is what I'm trying to say. When when I was 15, awful taste, G genuinely awful taste in everything. So, I mean, crikey, if people held that against me now, I mean, oh. Verbal Diorama would not be a podcast, let's be honest. <laughs> I would not be doing this. Um, yeah, so that's harsh. But anyway. Well, Cam, you said something about going down together into the background of this film, of course. So, um, you know, could you fill me in some more? There's a lot of background on this. <laughs> um, admittedly, it's a mouthful. But I think we'll get around it. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned it earlier, I can't, uh, one of you, um, that this was the um, 20th film, 40th anniversary movie. So there was a lot of pressure on it. And the producers were very desperate to not only have fresh ideas for this film and to honor the past as well. There's kind of like this back and forth. But they said they wanted to define what is the bond of the new millennium. And I think like they were putting them, uh, a lot of pressure on themselves to define Bond for the decade. Although I guess when you go back and look at the first Bond movie of a given decade, it tends to do that fairly well. But I guess they wanted to repeat that here. So they turned to Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, who had written World is Not Enough, and going forward are going to write a lot of Bond movies. And there was a few things that were kicking around. The North Korea element was so much in the public discourse at the time that that was automatically in. That's for sure what they wanted the villain to be tied to. Um, one of the early plots, though, that was come up with was rogue CIA operatives creating a decoy villain who was paid by the U.S. and ultimately turned on the employers. Now, that kind of went nowhere because 9-11 happened and the idea of creating a U.S.-funded villain, it just, not the time. So that fell by the wayside. But one of the th elements that did continue onwards was Pierce Brosnan at this point was very vocal about pushing Bond towards more character drama. It's something he really started in on with Tomorrow Never Dies onwards. And one element that had been kicking around for quite a while was Bond being captured and tortured. So that made Brosnan very happy. It gave him an angle on the character and uh, wound up being used. So... Around this point, they brought in Lee Tamahori, who was a New Zealand-born director. He had made a movie called Once Were Warriors um, about Maori culture that Barbara Broccoli was a huge fan of. He'd also done The Edge with Anthony Hopkins and Along Came a Spider with Morgan Freeman. Um, they'd also looked at a few other directors. Uh, they looked at Stephen Hopkins, who did Lost in Space, Stuart Baird, who did U.S. Marshals, and would go on to do um, Star Trek Nemesis this same year. And they also looked at Brett Ratner. So um, 
Thankfully, that one uh, didn't come to pass, because that would have aged really badly. <laughs> well, you, you just accidentally outed my second film. Oh, really? What was it then? You gotta give it away now. Well, yeah, Star Trek Nemesis. Same year. Oh, yeah, yeah. I dragged, dragged my entire family to go see it, and mm, I never mm. hear the end of that one. Okay, well, I, I was fearing you were going to say a 2002 Brett Ratner film, so I think uh, Nemesis is a step up. So, basically, Tamahori came in, he read the script, and he said he was hooked from the opening surfing scene. He had visions of what he wanted to do with this surfing scene, and that was, like, a big hook. He also really loved the fire and ice theme of the story, and visually he thought he could have a lot of fun with that. Um, now, Brosnan has an interesting quote that's in the James Bond archives, where he talks about Tamahari. And this had to have been given before they shot the movie, because Brosnan says, it's a reality-based character piece, and he's hungry for it. Would you call this movie a reality-based character piece, guys? I mean, I, I would maybe the first <laughs> third. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I was examining the words, reality-based character piece. It, the word based is correct, Peace is is true, but reality and characters, I see none of these things. Uh, yeah, like, I think that's going to be something interesting to talk about as we continue on through the review, but weird quote from Brosnan there. It must have happened mm. before production. It had to have been like a, you know, maybe a press thing or something. Uh, I certainly think that the tone of this movie does change. So the movie starts a certain way. It starts quite grounded, in my opinion, and then it just goes completely haywire. So it seems like they maybe had an idea to make this really gritty Bond movie, and then it's just like, no, actually, we want to be completely crazy. Um, yeah. So. So when it came to casting, um, you know, Barry was in pretty early on, but um, some of the other choices were interesting. Rick Yoon, um, who plays Zhao, came in, and he really wanted to play Colonel Moon. Um, the character played by Will Yun Lee um, at the start of the movie. And Tamahori actually talked him into taking the Zhao role. And I think that probably fared way better. You just get way more to do in, your, in the movie. So um, I'm really happy to actually have Rick Yun in that role. The other one was actually um, the Gustav Graves role. Now, um, Tamahori says a lot of actors turned it down. And his reasoning was interesting where he says they didn't really get it or they didn't embrace the double identity I'm wondering if it was also like a lot of actors read that on the page and said, mm, this sounds like it could be a little iffy. I don't know that I quite want to play this character. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a problematic element buried in here somewhere, isn't there? Oh, I mean, it's not even buried. It's, it's literally the problematic uh, aspect of Gustav Graves is not even buried. It's literally surface level. <laughs> yeah, quite literally. You're right, actually. Yeah, exactly yeah, on the surface. Yeah, quite literally uh, having a white man play a North Korean man. Yeah, uh, is not good, and I'm not surprised that quite a lot of people uh, weren't interested in that. So it doesn't surprise me in 2002 even that a lot of actors would maybe look at that and go, "Hmm, not really sure how to play that one. Uh, that seems problematic. I'm just going to bail on this one." So Toby Stevens ultimately took it, and he said his dream was always to play James Bond, but that didn't look like it was ever going to happen. So offered a Bond villain role, he said he had to take it. He was a big fan of the franchise, and I think he actually um, reads some of the novels now for some of the audiobooks, or even does some of he the does. radio dramas. Yeah, He does yeah. the BBC radio dramas. He's basically done most of the books at this point. His most recent one was 2018. I think he did Moonraker. Yeah, so the actual production, though, seems like it was fairly smooth. Brosnan said it was actually a lot of fun, other than he injured his knee quite badly during the hovercraft sequence and was out for two weeks while production had to mostly shut down. Um, Barry also had an eye injury at a certain point as well that uh, necessitated some medical care, but nothing too really, um, you know, grievous. But uh, it should be noted, Halle Berry won her Oscar for Monster's Ball during production of this film. And um, it's, it, which of course added hugely to the marketing and what the movie could really put up front. Like this is the first movie she makes post Oscar win. So there's a reason she's on all the posters and everything. Like they really wanted to market her in many ways on equal footing with James Bond. That's the first time that it ever really happened. So it's interesting. And um, it was interesting just also going through the archives and reading what Tamahari had to say about the movie's um, action sequences, particularly anything that came from the CG. And he talks about how he had real misgivings about the CG, 
Um, he was worried because he felt like if they didn't pull it off, it was all going to fall back on him. And he said, ultimately, it was like, well, this is where movies are going, so I guess this is where we're going. And so I think that's just an interesting to keep in mind as we continue onwards with this movie, which obviously very, very heavily influenced by a lot of the CG blockbusters of the time. And Tam Hori would go on to do the sequel to Triple X, and that movie is also wall-to-wall CG. Uh, so I wonder if he was a guy who just was making movies at the wrong time because uh, I don't I don't know that CG is, is his uh, strong suit. Well, could it have been done better at the time? Is there examples of CG that is, you know, just better done? Or was it just this is where the technology was in 2002? I mean, the problem was when you look at, say, like Jurassic Park, a lot of it is practical dinosaurs that they're CG augmenting. Like it's going back and forth between the two. A lot of movies just went crazy, though, in the 2000s where they just went all CG, like just all of it and they didn't have the ability and the stuff in some of the star wars prequels is good but they also have industrial light and magic making those movies they have the best of the best whereas that just wasn't the case for most productions um so i think that was also the problem and um you know dennis murin was overseeing the effects on both the star wars prequels and jurassic park he was like the mastermind um very much of the cg sort of ushering in of that whole era and uh he didn't work on this movie so i just think it was people trying to play catch up and that was the case with so many movies at the time yeah yeah i i completely agree i think that that in in movies that have great cg or look like they have great cg there's always at least a small practical element behind that um and i think the trend literally was put as much CG in your movie as possible and people won't care what it looks like. Mm-hmm. I think The Mummy Returns is a really good example, actually. Although if you'd have slandered The Mummy, then I would have stopped recording immediately. <laughs> but The Mummy Returns is a really good example because they actually, um, I mean, the CG is quite bad in that movie. Uh, and that's because it was a rushed production uh, and, and the CG wasn't actually finished. So um, I think a lot of this kind of reliance on CG is to kind of cut corners a little bit. Because it's like, well, we don't have time to shoot this practically, so let's just stick a CG something in there instead, and it'll make you know it, it makes do. Um, but of course, it doesn't make do because human brains aren't trained to not see CG. It's like you know the whole uncanny valley thing. You can tell that it's a CG version of James Bond that's you know surfing the huge kind of icy thing. Is it? It is ice, isn't it? Yeah, it's not a yeah, tidal it's, wave. It's a, yeah, it's a tidal wave ice. with ice. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I'm get I'm getting confused because I watched a movie this morning and it had like a tidal wave thing in it, and I'm just getting a bit confused with like ice and tidal waves and stuff. Um, well, I, I'm glad you bring up waves because actually, do you remember also around this point, a perfect storm came out, and all of that movie was marketing that big CG wave. So it was also a period mm-hmm. where filmmakers wanted to really market or not so much the filmmakers, but the advertisers really wanted to market um, big CG shots. And so yeah. that was also a big deal. And it sounds kind of ridiculous now because CG is, you know, aged so poorly. But at the time, you wanted that big, expansive, you know, computer-generated image in your trailers, especially as the impact shot at the end. So it's not shocking a lot of this wound up in this movie. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other note I'll make before getting to the um, production stuff is a pretty funny one. The invisible car, the vanish. Um, that was actually a Purvis and Wade idea. They said they pitched it and in their heads they were like, there's no way anyone's going to buy this. And they said they were shocked when the producers were like, hey, we like that. <laughs> so they got this car from Aston Martin. And this is where the fu- story gets funny. So Pierce Brosnan um, felt he was very much deserved to have this car. That when the production was over, this was a one-of-a-kind car, that he should be given the car for helping promote Aston Martin throughout the film. And Aston Martin was like, "Mm, we don't know about that. We actually um, don't really want to give you the car. So Brosnan actually refused to do publicity for the car after the movie, even going so far as to say he would not stand near it at uh, public events. And so Aston Martin had to give him the car. (laughs) And he knows here's... the car doesn't vanish in real life, doesn't he? I'm just just checking. He doesn't think that's like an add-on to the uh, the particular make and model. Um... Well, 
continuing on the fire and ice theme of Die Another Day, in 2015, the car had a freak fire and burned up, so Pierce Brosnan ultimately lost the car to fire. <laughs> oh, dear. So, yeah, I thought that anecdote was really funny. <laughs> it's such a big Hollywood thing to do, isn't it? It's such a, it totally oh, give me the damn car, or I won't stand next to it, and I'll throw my toys out the pram. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I hope that you guys have got my car uh, that, I, <laughs> that we agreed that I would get uh, for, for appearing. It's outside. Yeah. Can't you see it? Is it? Oh, it's a... oh it's, it's the, it is the vanish because it's not there. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um. <laughs> <sighs> so the budget for this movie was 142 million domestic, made 161 international, 271 for a worldwide total of 432 million dollars. For comparison, Golden Eye did 352, Tomorrow Never Dies 333, The World Is Not Enough 362. And so this one was the biggest grocer of Brosnan's career um, and also uh, one of the highest ranking Bond films. I mean, if you adjust for inflation, no. But uh, yeah, at the time, it was very much championed as a huge as a huge hit for them. Critically, not as well received, but that didn't really matter. Critics hadn't really been on Brosnan's side from Tomorrow Never Dies onwards. So, um, you know, Die Another Day was like a triumph in pretty much everyone's eyes. And uh, it landed at number six that year between... Men in Black 2, and Signs. Um, and the top three was, uh, number one was Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Number two was Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And number three was Spider-Man. So you can definitely see just from even that top three, the way that Hollywood is starting to lean. And it's kind of what we're still going through, where it's like three major franchises. It's interesting, the reception to it in terms of the box office, because obviously this is Pierce Brosnan's last time as Bond. Mm-hmm. And I know that there was a lot of people didn't like the, the the way this film went, some of the elements. You would just think that they would want to have him back for a fifth one if it did so well. Well, I've got a note on that. So um, there's a couple of things kind of in the in the wake of this movie. So Brosnan had a four film contract. It was um, basically up in the air for a fifth. And he says he was invited for a fifth, but then Eon changed their minds during negotiations. Now... Here's a quote from Michael G. Wilson. He says, Contract negotiations dragged on for a year with no resolution. Barbara and I were getting nowhere trying to develop a script to follow up from Die Another Day. We finally decided we need to reboot the series, bring it down to earth, and start again. So I just think it was kind of like things just got stuck. And that sort of spelled the end of the Brosnan era. And I just remember interviews at this time, like Brosnan was really hurt by all this. He was Mm. quite upset. So I feel bad because, you know, you don't really want Bond actors to have that sort of sense when they leave you know connery was just happy to be out of there Moore, it was kind of a graceful exit at least you know publicly maybe not with the final film we'll talk we'll talk about that later but in terms of the relationship Moore knew it was time to leave and that was kind of the end um dalton's a little a little uh, more up in the air but with you know pierce brosnan who does them for quite a while you kind of it's kind of a bummer note for him to go out on for sure he's a guy that has always defended his films and he loved being bond so to have him be ousted in that sense i think yeah would probably leave a bad taste in anyone's mouth yeah so just a couple of notes just to wrap up the behind the scenes the um song by madonna was very controversial um it had a golden globe nomination for best song and a nomination for the 2004 grammys for best dance recording but it also won the razzie for worst song and madonna won the razzie for worst supporting actress so Madonna, I mean, very polarizing. You, very polarizing. Can you, really, can you really say that she was a supporting actress when she was only in the movie for what, like three minutes? Yeah, I think if they were that... just. Uh, the Razzies are known to just take shots on people, and I think that was the case here. She was also nominated that same year for like worst actress of the decade or something. Uh, she didn't win that, but uh, yeah, the Razzies really had it out for her. I mean, I will, I will always back Madonna up because she was great in A League of Their Own. But I, I and, and to a certain extent, Dick Tracy as well. I thought she was quite good in that. But yeah. But to a degree, I think Madonna works really well when she's playing Madonna. Mm. <laughs> it more like a version of Madonna. And and I don't think that Verity, the fencing instructor, is kind of any facet of Madonna um, that that exists. So I think that's really the only issue with Madonna in this movie is she's not playing Madonna. Mm. Um, yeah. But I mean, I don't, I certainly don't hate Madonna in this movie. Um, and, and I'll be honest, 
I don't hate the song. Certainly not the best. Um, but I don't think it's the worst. But I've... then, you know, James Bond songs, they are quite iconic. So... Some are, some aren't. There are a few misses out there. Yeah. I'm not a fan of this song really at all. And I do wonder what a Madonna theme song would have been like more in the Like a Prayer era. Like, I think you could have gotten a much better Bond song. I just think she's at that whole kind of electronic dance period. And yeah. it just is a weird match. I, it's not like I have anything against Madonna doing a Bond song. I just think they got her at the wrong decade. Yeah. I love Madonna. I've seen Madonna live. I just, you know, in, but in terms of this song, and I might get back into it later, but I will just say at this point, I genuinely wish she had kept that secret. <laughs> Fair. So that, that's a line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, just the final note <laughs> that uh, they had planned a Jinx spinoff, and Halle Berry was attached to do this. They were looking at a late 2004 release. MGM wanted it to be sort of a alternative to the Winter Olympics. And they had a director on board, Stephen Frears, who directed The Queen, High Fidelity, and Dangerous Liaisons. So, guy of some note. And ultimately, these plans were scrapped about a year later in October 2003. Um, they had wanted to maybe do a Wylin film back post Tomorrow Never Dies. And it feels like they were kind of edging closer to that now with Jinx. And it just still didn't connect. I'll be curious if in the future, at some point, we do get a launch of a character in a Bond film into their own series, but not to be for these two. Well, given the recent Amazon purchase, anything's possible. I could totally see like Lashana Lynch's character from No Time to Die winding up in her own Amazon Prime series or something like that in the future, but that book is not yet written and I am wrapped up for my behind the scenes details on Die Another Day. Well, I think it's time to dissect this film. M, you're our guest, you're up first. What do you think? of Die Another Day. Okay, I am quite well known on Verbal Diorama for being very positive about movies because, like I said, it is very difficult to make a movie. Uh, none of us, uh, um, I mean, oh, well, I don't know who's listening, but I assume the vast majority of people who are listening to this have not made a feature length movie that's been out in the cinema. So, you know, you've kind of got to take it well. It is quite any movie that's made is, is quite a miraculous thing. So from the point of view that Die Another Day has been made, I, I can't be negative about that because it is, it is a collaborative affair. You've got so many people working behind the scenes. Um, and I do like to try and be as positive as possible. But, you know, I think if I'm coming on a podcast and you're, you're asking me to tell you what I think, I kind of feel like I have to be a little bit objective about it. Sure. Um, so, what do I think? Okay, as I said, this is a very 2000s movie. It feels 2000s, not just with the Madonna, you know, the Madonna song, but with the score in general. It's got loads of, like, electro, funk, pop stuff in its score. It feels very 2000s. The direction feels very 2000s. There's a lot of, like, sped-up shots, slow-mo shots, just really, it feels like this is like 2002 in a bottle. That's what this movie feels like. Um, and I kind of feel very much like this movie came out at the wrong time. Because this was, like Cam said earlier, this was Bond coming into the new millennium. And I feel like they obviously wanted to follow the trend at the time with obviously all of this overblown CGI and all of that stuff. But the problem was, was that I think cinema in general, and I'm, I'm kind of mainly focusing on, on the spy cinema that I'm aware of kind of in the early to mid 2000s, when if you look back at like the 60s and 70s, James Bond really was the cutting edge of action. If you wanted an action spy movie, you went to James Bond. James Bond was the man you went to see. But when it came to like the, the 2000s, you had the Jason Bournes, you had the Ethan Hunts, you know, the, the Bourne and Mission Impossible franchises were kind of becoming more of what people actually wanted to see. They wanted the sleek action. They wanted these kind of less fantastical plots and they wanted something that was really grounded in reality. And the whole kind of Bond's casual sex and copious amounts of martinis 
I mean, that is very much a Bond trademark. You you couldn't have a Bond movie without the casual sex and the, and the, and the shaken, not stirred martinis. But I kind of feel like all of that in the kind of early 2000s was kind of starting to fall out of favour with viewers a little bit. And especially these kind of the want for grounded realism. And it's kind of a double edged sword for Bond, really, because this movie kind of has a bit of both. It kind of has the, the gritty grounded realism at the start. And that's the stuff that I really think works well when Bond is being mm -hmm. tortured. And Pierce Brosnan actually gets something to do other than stand around in a tuxedo all the time. And I really like the start of this movie. I think the start of this movie is actually really good. Um, so you've got like this gritty grounded element and then it, it does go into the fantastical and the CGI and, and all of that kind of gubbins. And, and it, it, it's a little bit like to me that this movie didn't know what it wanted to be. It, it didn't want to be the gritty grounded a uh, super realistic movie at the start. It obviously wanted to have a CGI element and it wanted to have the humour and the puns and everything that James Bond is known for. But that wasn't really the kind of in thing. And obviously at the time as well, um, going like late 90s into the early 2000s, Austin Powers was really huge. Uh, you know, the Austin Powers movies were, were really, really big. Well, maybe not the first one. The second one definitely was really big and going into the third one in 2003, I believe it was. And it, but it doesn't really have that level of, of spoof and humour in this movie either. So it's not a, a Jason Bourne movie. It's not an Austin Powers movie. It's a James Bond movie. But it doesn't kind of know what it wants to be. And it's really frustrating, genuinely frustrating that this movie has bits in it little sparks that i think are so promising um and, and really kind of interesting analysis of of this movie and, and what this movie kind of meant for the james bond franchise i mean it is genuinely fascinating to look into it, what, it, what it sounds like in like a digested form is you found it to be a conflicted film uh yeah. with bits of, of enjoyment that you took from it but overall somewhat disappointed yeah i mean uh, okay. to be honest I, I don't give one word answers i mean you know i have to talk to myself on a podcast <laughs> for an hour so you're not going to get a one word answer out of me but if you were to ask me one word answer i yes i would say disappointing okay right um i i think cam set it up quite well with his behind the scenes it, it trying to spin a lot of plates at once so the, the confliction makes sense cam what do you think well scott i could learn to like it if I had the time. Uh. <laughs> uh, no, okay. Wait, 40 so... minutes for that line to be delivered. 40 minutes. I've been waiting for that. Okay. So, um, Die Another Day, watching it last night. I'm kind of in the same boat as M, where this movie is just a tug of war back and forth for a while for what the soul of this movie is. Because you have, you know, and I can understand why I dug it in parts when I saw it originally. You know, you start off with like the torture stuff, which I think is such a great idea. I've never seen that in a Bond movie. They're doing things we've never seen before. That's always exciting in a, you know, a 40 year old franchise at this point. Um, and then it's like the movie keeps introducing, you know, stuff I like, you know, you have that scene with um, um, M facing Bond in the medical room and she's saying, you know, why didn't you use your cyanide? You've been compromised. We had to get you out because you were hemorrhaging information. All this sort of stuff. You're like, ooh, this is gritty. And this feels like the sort of thing we would get delved into much more deeply in, like, Skyfall with Silva, for example. Um, and it's stuff like this I'm really digging. And the movie keeps introducing stupid things. So, you know, you'll have Bond stopping his heart. And you're like, oof. Like, I guess Bond is ripping off Batman at this point. That's kind of weird. But then, you know, you kind of edge back into classic Bond walking to a hotel, having contacts everywhere. And I'm like, okay, I'm back on board. And then it just keeps hitting you with stupid things. And it does it consistently and then amps it up once you get to that ice palace. And it just tips completely over like that ice palace under a ray from the sun. Like it just starts to fall apart. And I find it wears me out every time. And that's not something... I would say about most Bond movies, like um, pretty much all uh, Bond movies, like 
they may have their big um, bombastic action sequences, but they don't feel like bombastic movies. In this movie, everything feels very dialed up at a certain point, and like there are no small lines, there's no little you know quick witty throwaway kind of quips or just visual gags. Everything's big and in your face. <laughs> so by the end, where you just have like giant CG planes flying through CG beams of light and all this bad green screen, I'm just I'm so mentally checked out that it frustrates me. That said, it's the type of movie that. I know I'm going to revisit many more times over the course of my life because every time I go in, I'm like, okay, there's things to appreciate here. Um, you know, Brosnan seems very comfortable in the role. Um, he's kind of mellowed out in some ways. He doesn't have the try-hard attitude. He's just embracing who Bond is. He's doing his best, um, although his Irish accent is more prominent in this film, especially in the first half, than in any of the other Bond films he does. But... Um, Nonetheless, like I like what he's doing. There's various things we'll talk about, I'm sure, going forward. But just so frustrating because it really does tip over into a mess. But, you know, Scott, let's hear from you. So this film starts off with Bond being tortured for 14 months. I think then the director, Lee Tamahori, decided to then torture us for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand why I didn't revisit this film. I have to say, I'm not going to, uh, it's got good bits to it. There's things I will talk about later that I had some moments I enjoyed. And there are good things in there, trust me. But it feels so devoid of life and that charm and that charisma that should be coming from a Bond film. I don't mind bad CGI. I can almost put that in a box. But I feel like all the performances are just either super hammy or super stilted. Mm-hmm. Um there's nothing really there for me to latch on to and you know you've got this horrible dialogue being delivered by you know, people wouldn't say those words that exchange between jinx and bond at the beach is i i don't know who speaks like that and i'd love to meet someone who does maybe wade and purpose do i don't know i've heard a couple of jokes about that exchange trying to justify it i think and i mean jokingly justify it one was that it sounds like um English that was translated to another language, then back to English, then back to another language, and then back to English, <laughs> and then forced the actors to say it. The other one I've heard is that this is just how hot people talk to each other, Scott. This is what happens when two unbelievably gorgeous people talk to each other. Everything's based on just the sheer beauty in front of them. It doesn't matter what they're saying. <laughs> I, I must admit that that, that particular uh, exchange, I mean, obviously, you're, you're so glamoured by the beauty of Halle Berry. I think what happens is you see Halle Berry and I don't, you know, whether you're male, female, whatever, you look at Halle Berry and you go, oh, my God, she is one of the most stunning creatures on the planet. She emerges out of the sea. And then I think your brain just switches off and you don't actually hear what they're saying because you're so fixed on the beauty of Halle Berry that it, you're a little bit like it doesn't matter what she's saying because she's so pretty. Uh, and I mean... I, I genuinely think Halle Berry is one of the best things in this movie, but I certainly don't think that the exchange that they have at the start, I mean, that is not, I mean, Halle Berry can definitely do better than that. The, the, the delivery, oh, yeah. I mean, obviously she's not in charge of the script. She's not in charge of what she's saying, but the, just the way she says it, it's, it's very clear that she knows what she's saying is absolute tosh. <laughs> she doesn't believe what she's saying at all. Um, luckily, I think her character does get a lot better uh, as as the film progresses. But I think she's the only thing that does get better. Jinx, Jinx is something I want to talk about in a minute. But I, I will just say, if I was presented with Halle Berry coming out of the ocean to walk towards me, I don't think the delivery of the word mojito would be quite the same. I think mine would be something closer to uh, uh, mojito. <laughs> And then I'd probably just fall to the floor and start, I don't know, vibrating or something. I don't know. <laughs> I would require that guy's wheelchair that uh, Bond <laughs> had to use at a certain point. Uh, but, yeah, I think I think we're all more or less on the same page about this film. I think Cam probably likes it the most out of the three of us, but I'm not saying you well... might like it. You just, you, yeah, I, I'm not putting you on that ship, Cam. Don't worry. <laughs> Please don't. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't want to go that, there. That, that ship's going down fast, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be those guys on the Titanic playing the instruments as it's going down. <laughs> My acapella, Die Another Day theme song <laughs> recital. We're, sh 
I could. You did say you could learn to like it. Yeah. <laughs> That's much better. That's much better. Okay. Well. Okay. I, there's a lot to dissect about what we didn't like in this film, but what I want to do is put that to the side for a second and talk about the good stuff, because there is some mm-hmm. here. Yeah. It's a Bond film. I think you can find a good thing in any Bond film, even Never Say Never Again. Um, so I'm going to throw it out to M first. Mm-hmm. I, I think I know what your answer might be, but what's your favourite thing about this film? Uh, okay. You're only giving me one again. No, you, you're not even... Well, we're going to pass it around. We're going to pass it around. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm not going to mention Halle Berry then because I've already said her. Um, I think one of the best scenes overall is the practical sword fight. Because it's one of yes. very few practical yeah. <laughs> demonstrations in this movie. And and I think it's really good, actually. Uh, despite it being literally dripping with toxic masculinity and ego. Um, it is literally two male characters. They, they might as well be fighting with their... It might as well be a cockfight, actually. Let's be honest. Madonna was absolutely right. Mm. It is a cockfight. They are whipping them out. And they are basically using their penises as swords uh, to prove how <laughs> masculine and butch they are. Um, but it is uh, a great way to kind of introduce Gustav Graves. Um, well, no, actually, that's not when they introduce him, but but to kind of uh, get to know his personality and his character. And clearly he's competitive. He doesn't like to lose uh, and certainly doesn't like to lose to someone like James Bond. So, um, yeah, I, I really like that scene as a whole, mainly for the practical stuff. But also there's a, a quite a good little bit of character development in there as well, which I quite like. I mean, Em, what you don't know is that's how Cam and I met <laughs> was, was sword fighting, but not with swords. Oh. <laughs> well, the, the, the sad part is Scott and I met at a Star Trek convention, so it was actually just fake fi- uh, phasers. It was really embarrassing. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just reminded. I know, it's not, I know it's not Star Trek, but I just had an image, you know, of um, the Star Wars episodes of Family Guy. And... Um, mm. Herbert playing um, the Obi Wan Kenobi character, and he's got his lightsaber, and and he just kind of droops over. Uh, just, I just had that image pop into my head, and I don't know why. I'm really sorry that that image popped into my head. Um, You're not far off. Don't worry. You're not far off. But Cam, you had something nice to say. Yeah. So, well, I want to talk about that sword fight for a second, and that. It is very amped up, but it's grounded, again, all practical action and stunts. It feels real. It's character-driven. And it even has a little bit of a nod to Goldfinger because Mm -hmm. um, they're playing for diamonds in this scene. It's very much like him throwing the gold in front of Goldfinger while they're playing golf. It's just a more amped up version of that. I appreciate the sort of way that they're paying homage to the past as they want to do. You know, we had gadgets in, you know, Q's lair from past movies. Here we actually have a scene playing out in a different way. It's more amped up, but I think I think it still works. And Toby Stevens is someone who I actually really appreciate in this movie, and this is where I'm kind of segging into something I enjoyed. Toby Stevens has like almost a no-win assignment with this character. Um, the way he's introduced is so vague, they won't give any sort of backstory because it's all based on a twist. But like he's given terrible dialogue, but he does it so hammy, and he has it like and he has such an amazing sneer that I kind of love this villain. I wish he'd had more to do. I think if you gave Toby Stevens maybe a different character in a different Bond movie, he could have been genuinely amazing and maybe a fan favorite. But here, he's one of the few things I enjoy is just listening to him spout off the worst lines, like just endless lines, you know, that somehow tie to dreams or all that sort of stuff. And it's all ridiculous, but he does it with such a uh, delicious snarl. Yeah, I I can definitely understand it's a bit of a, a thankless task in terms of Gustav Graves. I mean, having to utter the phrase in earnest, look, parachutes for the both of us. Whoops, not anymore. (laughs) I kind of like that one. I I hate more the um, uh, watch the rising of your son. (laughs) That's the worst. (laughs) Uh, um, I I actually, I didn't mind uh, Gustav Graves in the sense of the idea of the character in a way. I wish they hadn't done the whole a whitewashing issue. Um, I also don't like the fact that his character, when he is Colonel Moon, uh, it seems to be quite an adept martial artist and then apparently loses that and needs to have a Nintendo Power Gauntlet yeah, to, what was that? Be, to be menacing. I don't know what that whole thing was. I feel like it was like a, a bit of a script that had been left over. <laughs> it's like it came out of nowhere. He had his big sunbeam. And I was like, oh, okay, he's got a big cool sunbeam. 
it's you know ev- everything has to have a beam coming out of the sky i'm i'm cool with that um and he likes swords because you saw him fencing although you never see that again well yeah like why why did he have a magic electric glove all of a sudden <laughs> that made no sense the worst part of that too is that he not only has the gloves, he has the whole, like, get-up, which looks like VR gear or something. <laughs> but, like, the that is revealed in the big emotional moment for that character where his father shows up and he turns around. He's wearing, like, googly goggles. Oh, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> hello, father. And you're like, oh. Like, I actually, I really like Kenneth Sang as his father. I think he actually is giving a good performance. And, like, talk about just shooting yourself in the foot when it comes to an actual emotional character moment. Yeah, a, a strange choice, but we're keeping it upbeat for now. I'm going to go with the bit I enjoyed as a kid and still enjoy now, which is the invisible car. What? I think that's kick-ass. I mean, the the you invisible not, car did you is not like actually that? okay. Like, I don't understand why people yeah. don't like it. I think it's really cool. Yeah, I think I can answer why people don't like it. And I think it has less to do with the actual car. Because like you, Scott, I walked out of the theater having kind of indifferent attitude toward the car. Um... It's used very sparingly. There's a couple shots, but they also show that it's faulty, that if you know someone walks in front of it, it gets distorted. Like It's not like it's completely invisible. I can understand the tech that they're explaining to me. I think the problem with the car is that to a lot of people, and I, I'm talking more of a general audience that goes to see a movie like this, something's wrong, and they're not responding to it. And I think they tend to point to one specific thing that maybe stands out as an example of the larger problem. And this movie's very overblown, as we've said, with CG and kind of ridiculousness. And I think they point to the car because that is the easy thing to sum it up. There's an invisible car that extends to the rest of the movie. I don't know that the actual specific use of the car, though, is that bad. No, and the thing the thing that actually annoyed me about the car was it felt like, obviously, Bond uses the car. Uh, he gets the car. He uses the car to kind of sneak in to Graves' um, special area that sounds quite wrong actually i don't mean that special area <laughs> so he, he uses it to sneak in obviously i mean one of the things it's it's quite ludicrous is obviously it leaves tire tracks because it's a car why no one noticed mm-hmm. that there was like all of these visible tire tracks like magically appearing in the snow i have no idea but if we suspend our disbelief for a second he uses the invisible car he parks it outside graves's uh special area like i like to say and uh, and then obviously he leaves it there. And so the car isn't then used until essentially the finale of the movie, uh, just before you have the cars driving on ice extravaganza. You know, it's a bit like Disney on ice, but it's James Bond in a car. Um, and the, the thing that annoys me so much is they obviously had a plan for the car. They were like, right, we're going to get Bond to have an invisible car. It's going to be awesome. He's going to be able to sneak in anywhere. He's going to be able to leave the car there. And then he's going to be able to escape. It's going to be immo- it's going to be amazing. And so you're telling me that it was parked outside the front door for God knows how long, and no one noticed. I know, I know, it's invisible. No one walked into it. No one noticed tire tracks. It, it's just honestly, it was right to the front door, right? And then yeah. it's it's like not used again until the end. I actually would have liked to see more. And I know that's ridiculous because it's invisible. But I would have liked to see them actually utilise the car because what's the point of having a car at the beginning then using the car at the end and just like leaving it parked in the front of the house essentially for the rest of the movie? Made no sense. Um, I feel like they didn't know what to do with the car. <laughs> you, you've not you've not noticed the one that we sent you. It's still sat outside. Well, it is still sat outside. And, I, and I'm really, really looking forward to, to once I find it. Uh, what I might have to do is I might have to get a guy on a snowmobile to drive into it so I can find it. <laughs> but how did that not happen sooner? I, I don't know. And the problem also is that the car is silent. I think, and it's one thing the writers brought up was in their minds, the car is something you would use like in the desert, in the snow, like very barren landscapes and that it would have vulnerabilities. And maybe they should have played more with the vulnerabilities of this car. Sure. Sure. Um. Okay. Now we've all had one each, but, Em, you mentioned Jinx in the start. You didn't choose that for your one. Mm-hmm. But Cam, I haven't really heard your opinion on the Jinx character. Did it work for you? Uh, Jinx is sort of a mixed bag for me in that 
she has a lot of terrible dialogue and that's not Halle Berry's fault. Um, I think in terms of all the physical stuff that like Halle Berry pulls off the action, she pulls off everything that deals with physical acting. Um, but I think one of the th cool ideas that they had here was that what happens basically if a character from another movie franchise wanders into a Bond film. And I think that's what they wanted to do with Jinx. You know, the fact they wanted to give her a spinoff kind of leads into that. The idea that this character who's with at the NSA has Michael Madsen as their boss. Like there's a whole other world there that's just wandering into this movie. I think that's a really cool idea. And I just think they have really kind of botched the writing of Jinx in ways that are interesting. Like, Bond had a lot of years to hammer out all the various quirks of that character. So I'm not faulting Jinx for not having those in movie number one. But I think they needed to emphasize what are some of the traits of Jinx. Because I don't really know. She makes references to, you know, relationships. Um, she does a lot of action scenes. But I don't understand who she is as an actual character versus as an action hero. So I think they needed to work maybe a little more there. But... I don't know, like, I, I have liked Halle Berry in a lot of things, you know, her, she's amazing in the third John Wick movie. Mm -hmm. I think the problem mm -hmm. with Halle Berry is she's someone who needs a really strong director and good dialogue, and you can get great work out of her. She can't, she's not good in projects that are kind of aimless or badly written. You know, you watch Catwoman, which she did, I think, the next year, and it's like, again, an actor who's floundering. And I just think here, Tamahari was not a very good actor's director. I think he was probably really busy dealing with a lot of the technical stuff, all the CG elements. And I just, I wonder, you know, like say Martin Campbell had worked with Halle Berry on this movie. Like what we could have gotten out of that Jinx character could have been really special. Here, it's inoffensive to me, but I also am frustrated by how much more it could have been. Yeah. I can see that. I, I'm probably more towards M out of the two of us. I think there's a lot of promise in the character. And I just think she didn't have enough time to really flesh it out because she is still secondary to Bond. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have been against a, a spin-off. Not that we'll ever get that now, I don't think. No. But let's let's move on to maybe some uh, some gripes. I'm sure we have a few. M. I I think you might have one in your back pocket. Oh, I have, I mean, I have more than one, but if you're only asking me for one. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier about the, the kind of, I really like the realism of this movie and I, and I really like the, the start. Uh, and I, I think Cam mentioned earlier the scene with M and when I say M, I don't mean me, obviously I did not star in this hmm. movie. I am not Judy Dench. There is nowhere on earth that I could be as amazing as, as Dame Judi Dench could ever be. So, but when, um, when you have that little exchange between Bond and M and you've got the, the glass in between them and, you know, he's been renounced of his double O status and all of that stuff. I thought that was all so great. And I was like, I really am enjoying getting some really gritty Bond He's been betrayed. Um, they think that he's sold secrets to North Korea and all of that stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm really interested in this. And then, so Bond sort of has a cardiac arrest, hmm. but it's not a fake cardiac arrest because you can't really do a fake cardiac arrest, can you? But so it's a real cardiac arrest. So he manages to stop his heart beating fine okay so maybe he's under a lot of stress because he's been rescinded as double o and all of that sort of stuff and so he has a heart attack it's just so ludicrous and so he, has, he, he goes in a cardiac arrest and then obviously a very good looking nurse and a couple of uh, of doctors come in and, and try and resuscitate him and and the very good looking lady nurse gives him the kiss of life as as you would do um, I mean, it doesn't look like a proper kiss of life to me, but what do I know? Anyway, um, you also wouldn't in a hospital do that. To be fair, mm -hmm. you, yeah. they have breathing apparatus for that very reason. I mean, I, I, I'm not a medical professional. I'll be completely honest, so I, I don't actually know that uh, for certain. But I, I'll take your word that they they would use proper apparatus. You wouldn't have, you know, any sort of kiss of life situation in in a genuine hospital. But but then, so not only is, has Bond been able to stop his own heart beating 
then he basically recovers straight away and <laughs> oh it's got it it's one of the most and there's a lot of ludicrous scenes in this movie but that i have i i i just don't get it <laughs> like was it fake or was it real and then he just magically recovers straight away I think he's doing the Batman thing. Like that's something that Batman has been able to do with years of training is to stop his heart. And I think that is what we are being told is that Bond has the discipline to be able to do this. But he's never done it before. <laughs> has he? Well, to, to be fair, Bond learns a lot of new skills in movie to <laughs> movie. Okay. So I'm not going to fault that necessarily. Especially when it's needed for the plot. I mean, I, I apologize. I apologize to James Bond. I'm sorry that I question his skills. Uh, I certainly don't question he is a terrific British spy. Um, I I just, yeah. I, I, but that's, that's kind of when it, it started to go silly for me. <laughs> it was at that point that I thought, yeah, this, this, is, this is not the movie that I signed up for. <laughs> because everything before it... That's, that's 10 so minutes good. into the film, everyone. That's 10 <laughs> minutes into the film. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It just sprinkles those moments throughout the first half. And then it just doubles down in the second, like going full bore. But the warnings are there right from, you know, the moment uh, one. Yeah, I think it um, I think it picks up a little bit again when he goes to Hong Kong. I'm not sure about him swimming that whole way. No. Uh, but let's not question that. Um, you know, because he's kind of a spy again. He smashes the glass. He knows he's being watched. We get the uh, plenty fountains of... Uh, Peaceful joy. fountains of desire, Scott. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Get it right. That's a classic name. Very well known. Peaceful Fountains <laughs> of Desire. Of course, of course, of course. Um, that's all That's all quite cool. One thing I had, had a gripe with, and this is actually resonating uh, previous guest Janine, uh, your sister Cam, talking about uh, Pierce Brosnan being sort of the uh, your dad Bond. Yeah. This film feels like the one for me where he is playing dad. Hmm. Like, yeah. he is... He's full on yucking it up with the jokes. Um, he's not as physical as he was in some of his previous films, although he does have the sword fighting scene. I'll give him that. But, um, you know, especially with his like post lockdown look, as I called it in my notes, like I just feel like he is full dad bond at this point. I think Brosnan had done a movie on Robinson Crusoe um, around the time of this movie, maybe a few years before, but I remember thinking when I saw him in this movie with the beard and everything, that it reminded me of the uh, artwork I'd seen for Robinson Crusoe. So I don't know that many people made that connection. But yeah, like, I don't know. Like, I look at more as, like, Brosnan's just comfortable in the role, but it's like, this is his bond. It has that sort of dad mode, and it's very telling that this movie's acronym is dad. So um, <laughs> why not embrace it? <laughs> yeah, James Bond dad it is. Um, I was going to say that one of the notes I made on this movie, it was kind of a similar thing that I kind of felt like that Pierce Brosnan, obviously, he, he kind of comes across as quite sort of comfortable in the role uh, in a sense of like his his physique mm. in the when when it and it, it, it's also quite interesting as well, because back in the sort of, you know, early to mid 2000s, there wasn't this kind of emphasis on the male body so much. You know, your hero could be pretty much any shape. Um, it, it didn't really matter. Yep. Um, and it's only kind of recently. And, and I don't know whether the Daniel Craig Bond is responsible, but obviously going from Diana of the Day into Casino Royale, where you, you do have an incredibly physically fit, sculpted Bond, um, there is like a, a marked change in male physique in cinema. Um, I mean, if you look, you know, just, just to kind of make it topical for me, if you, if you look at the Marvel movies nowadays and you look at a character like Thor, yeah. um, you know, Chris Hemsworth is basically getting more ripped every single movie because it's, it's almost like it's expected of him. You look at um, the X-Men movie from 2000, you look at Hugh Jackman's physique in that movie, it's very similar actually to um brosnan's physique in this movie um but then you look at how hugh jackman transforms his body throughout the uh x-men franchise and into the the wolverine franchise and and through into logan uh how much of his physique actually changes 
and I find that quite fascinating to look back at this movie and, and to see uh, a James Bond and, you know, looking obviously back to the Sean Connery Bond and it was all chest hair and, and all of that sort of stuff. And that's not really something that we see nowadays in our male heroes. I mean, I don't know if, if you guys have noticed that. I mean, maybe I notice it because I'm a woman. Uh, or a heterosexual woman. So maybe I just notice uh, the physique of my uh, men on screen. But I don't know if that's something that you guys have picked up, obviously, going through spy cinema in general and, and seeing all these different representations of, of the male body um, and how that's changed. I'd be interested to figure out, in terms of history of cinema, where that, that, that idea, that concept, that image does change. Because you are right. Up until this point, all of the Bonds have basically had the what you would call the Pierce Brosnan body in this, uh, you know, they've got the love rug going on. Hmm. <laughs> the love rug, I love that. I've never heard that terminology before, but now well, I'm going to use uh, that. For let, let's put it this way: I, I have to call mine that, so uh, it, it, it's it's uh, it's like a defense <laughs> mechanism. I'm defending Pierce Brosnan, basically. Um, now I I don't know when it changed into this sort of body image version because I know when they went to Daniel Craig, they wanted to change the physicality of Bond. He's more of a force of nature at those films, you know. He's running through walls. Yeah. Whereas this is, all up until this point, the Bond is rooted in that classic 50s style of, of international man of mystery, spy, that, that sort of thing, where you didn't want to stand out. You wanted to look inconspicuous. So you didn't want to look like a man mountain like Thor. Right. And I kind of appreciate that Pierce Brosnan has that look. I but I would be interested to see where it changed. Yeah, I mean, obviously Daniel Craig blows that out of the water when he comes out of the water, a la you know Ursula Andress or Jinx, um, kind of setting the mold for what Bond should look like. But I guess around that era, that is sort of thing. I mean, I wonder if there's a little bit of um, looking as well at like you know you've got Triple X coming out this year, which is like a big hit with Vin Diesel. It's sort of that um, we're starting to see it shift a little bit back towards. Um, you know, like you go to the eighties, you got all the Schwarzenegger Stallone stuff. And then now we've got Vin Diesel's really popular. We're going to have the rock getting more and more popular. Maybe that's a part of it. And suddenly it became a big deal for actors as well. So beginning with the first Spider-Man movie to look really pumped up. And you see that in Spider-Man, you see it, um, kind of going forward in like all of the superhero movies. Um, so it's probably a, kind of combination i think christian bale in the first batman movie that's very true so it's probably just kind of a slowly building train i would think um well cam what about you pick an issue something you want to talk about oh there's two big ones i want to talk about but i'll start with one of them um there's a lot of bad writing in this movie and a lot of it is actually things that deflate the film i think in a lot of ways so we have this whole torture story and um a lot of this movie is him being like someone set me up someone set me up and the movie gives us one candidate as to who that could be and it's not interesting so we're kind of just waiting for the miranda frost reveal and like rosamund pike is a great actress i've liked her in a lot of things but i mean it's a thankless role here and i'm so frustrated waiting for this character to reveal themselves because the movie a has given her no personality and b has told us right from the get-go there's a traitor and it makes mi6 look incompetent I kind of sympathize with Michael Madsen when he's saying to uh, to M, like, get your house in order, all that sort of stuff. Like, what's going on on your end? Because M is then annoyed that, like, they didn't know that um, Colonel Moon had been in the fencing team with her at, like, Harvard. It's like, you're MI6. Shouldn't you have done your research? Like, shouldn't you know these things? It just, <laughs> there's so much checks. bad writing, and it all seems to just make MI6 look super incompetent. And it's all tied to this... Miranda Frost character that I find very frustrating. I don't want to hear characters sp spend the whole movie saying, someone set me up, someone set me up, if there's only one candidate who could have done it. Yeah, and they introduce her quite quite quickly after that as well. So it's basically, you've got uh, Bond saying, someone set me up, and then, oh, by the way, here's, here's Rosamund Pike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, okay, so the movie's basically telling me who it is then. <laughs> so it's, it's not very subtle at all. And they're not doing anything to endear the character yeah. to the audience. She's played off as this, uh, well, frosty person, pardon the pun. Um, and so you instantly don't like her. She's prickly. And then you find out she's the turncoat. Okay. Uh, Colour me surprised. Yeah. I find it very frustrating. Like when you look at, you know, some of the other um, secondary Bond 
villains who are female in the past in the franchise, you know, there's a number of them that maybe they don't have a lot of dialogue, but they have genuine character. Like, you remember them. Whereas, like, Miranda Frost, it feels like she's written too broadly, where it's just like, I don't know, she's icy. That's her thing. Well, that's not particularly interesting to watch. And so, Rosamund Pike's doing her best. Um... You know, she's fine. Like, she has presence on screen. I think that's why we remembered her when she continued on in her career. It's like, oh, she actually had presence in this movie. But as a character, she's not memorable. It, it just goes to show, I read a note uh, from an interview with Rosamund Pike that a part of her interview process for this film was she had to do a screen test and they made her take her dress off to go down to her underwear. And, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a scene at the end where for some reason she's got her top off. I don't know why. And I, I don't know what that does for the character. And so I sit there going, they don't know what this character is. They're just putting a lady on screen. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a little bit like, it, it kind of harks back to, uh, do you remember the, talking obviously back to Star Trek, You the, the Star Trek, um, I think it was the second Star Trek movie the, of the of the new generation of yeah. Star Trek, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, where you had Alice Eve. And she was playing a really mm-hmm. interesting character. I believe it was Carol Marcus. Correct. And a really interesting character. And then all of a sudden she turns up in a, you know, in her underwear, just really randomly. And you're like, okay, I know she's a beautiful woman. I know you want to say we have a beautiful woman in our cast, but why do you have to do that? Why do you have to have her stand there in a bra and knickers? It that just literally does nothing apart from titillation. And I kind of feel like... It's trailer bait. Yeah, it is. And I kind of feel like... You know, in many ways, I mean, this is just a general kind of Bond girl thing, but in many ways, that's what a Bond girl is there for. She's there for uh, audience titillation uh, above mostly any other thing. Uh, I think it's quite good. Uh, Some Bond girls do have, uh, you know, really good character development. You know, you look at someone like Vespa Lind. She's really, really memorable, really good actress. And you, you remember her immediately. You know who she is. And and it's just really unfortunate with with a character like Miranda Frost, who literally her only her only character thing is she's frosty. And it's like, but it's a beautiful girl playing her. So of course she has to fight Halle Berry at the end in in a bra, which essentially it is it, uh, just a bra. Uh, and Halle Berry has to take her combat top off. And she's obviously wearing a tight fitting vest. And it's like these things kind of seemingly have to happen. You always have to have girl on girl action, um, you know, with characters getting their boobs out. And it is a little bit ridiculous. Well, here's the thing, though. You think about just the Brosnan era. If we're we're just dissecting Bond as a Brosnan era, it started off with, you know, Zenia on the top and Natalia. And they are, you know, a well-written Bond girl who isn't isn't showing off her figure really she she's dressed normally she's a scientist most of the film um and you know she actually has an arc and then you've got Zenia on the top who's written as someone who almost kills bond yep she actually has some you know velocity behind the character you you think she might just pull it off on a different day catching bond on a bad day and and then four films later they've just you know devolved back to the Sean Connery mm-hmm. Bond girls. Well, it feels like they didn't learn anything from the criticisms of Christmas Jones in the previous film. And it's mm. weird when I look at the the two females, uh, female leads in this movie, um, they, they don't even feel like characters. It feels like someone doing an imitation of what they think Bond girls are. And yeah. I, I don't know how much of the blame of this should be on Lee Tamahari. I, I'm kind of leaning towards a fair amount in that it, a lot of this movie, not just them, but a lot of this feels bordering on parody of what a James Bond movie is. It feels like it's almost trying to imitate James Bond. And that's what both these characters, to me, like Jinx and um, Miranda Frost, like, I think Jinx is more successful than Miranda Frost as a character for me, but it often feels like they're almost being written and uh, being told to perform almost like adult film actresses in a movie. Like, they're played as these really, like, one-dimensional fantasy objects in a way that I think the Bond franchise has frequently tried to work around especially with natalie you know scott you cited it they were saying back in 1994 or 5 when they were talking about their intentions with that character we want to make the bond girl of the 90s and it's like okay like you were on the right track and here it feels retrograde it's like i don't know what happened honestly 
Yeah, I, I completely agree, 100%. They definitely, this, this movie does feel like, and it, it's funny actually, because this movie purposefully does pay homage to so many of these previous movies. It sets out to pay homage with, you know, Gustav Graves parachuting down with a Union Jack on his parachute to all of the gadgets and, you know, all of the callbacks to all of these older movies. But it feels like, it does feel like, I think you're right, it does feel like this is essentially trying it's almost like it's trying to be a Bond movie, but it's not part of the franchise. It, it's someone's interpretation of what a Bond movie should be, but it it doesn't it doesn't work. This leads beautifully into the one I was going to pick because it, it is basically this point. This film to me feels like an imitation. You look at the popular spy films of the genre, sorry, spy films of the era. You've got, you know, Mission Impossible 1 and 2 are out by this point. Triple uh, X has come out. And these spy films are going down this action route. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like the script writers and Lee Tamahari have said, OK, what if James Bond was in a, you know, balls to the walls action film? As, as campy as it can go, you know, full pedal, full pedal down and let's go for it. The problem is then, it makes it feel like an imitation because it loses all of the charm and charisma, and I mentioned this earlier, that a Bond film should also have. It, it, it is almost devoid of charm. And so it feels like there's these false characters walking around, pretending to be in a Mission Impossible film, um, and and this is what you end up with. These, these two-dimensional Bond girls, a maybe not even two, maybe they only have one dimension. And then, you know, you've got the Gustav Graves bad guy, let alone the whitewashing side of it, who is just hamming it up as if it was just some, you know, campy 80s you know, action film. Yeah, and then you extend that to the action scenes, which feel like imitations of Bond action scenes, but done through, um, again, that 2000s mold where they feel stripped of sort of the exhilaration and the fun of James Bond action sequences. Because not every James Bond action sequence from the past is aged wonderfully. Like, there's lots of them that you kind of watch now and you go, oh, okay, okay. But they have a certain charm about them. And there is no charm to, like, the majority of the action in this movie. I think the sword fight, which Am highlighted earlier, has that charm. But there is, like, a triple threat here where we have, like, the Bond in the uh, rocket car, the car going off the cliff... And the surfing sequence, all one after another. And that actually leads right into the um, car chase, which is a little better. But these are like big, bombastic, expensive sequences that have no fun to them. Like they don't feel like they engage with you. You kind of sit there passively watching them. They don't feel like they're directed in a way that is really made to be that fun. Um, and then you kind of lead into the plane sequence, which is more of the same. I just found all that stuff exhausting in a way I don't find Bond action stuff exhausting most of the time. When you look at the Christopher McQuarrie and the most recent Mission Impossible films, they're great films. Yeah. Um, but he treats them like little mini movies, action movies within in this larger film. And Ethan Hunt as a character doesn't really have much of a personality. He has a background with the, the women that have sort of followed him through the films and they, they are around. But Ethan Hunt is basically your your access into the film itself. He's meant to be basically blank so you can pretend to be Ethan Hunt on these missions. Whereas Bond has X amount of books, 20 films at that point, of development you know who bond should be and this and unfortunately i don't think pierce brosnan's bringing that bond was he was he able to though that's my question sure do you mean because of the script the script the direction um the fact he's being overwhelmed with massive cg sequences like uh, i don't know i think it's a real struggle here yeah i mean i i have like a, a final thoughts question that's kind of in this realm but you know is, is there anything else anyone wants to talk about well i just want to hear from you guys in terms of those big cg action action sequences like do you find them as egregious as i do where it's actually like actually boring to sit through them yes <laughs> <laughs> i think that i think i you know i do agree they there is a, a level of of an act of action uh, in a film, whether it's CG or whether it's practical, that you can enjoy and you can find engaging and you can be really shocked and surprised and, you know, in all of the fantastic sense, it doesn't matter whether they're CG or practical. I mean, obviously, practical is uh, always preferable, but um, the, the, 
the CG in this movie, it kind of, it takes you out of a place that's already taken you out of a place. So it's almost like a bit inception-y in that, you know, you've you've already reached dream state level one and now you, <laughs> you're kind of going into another dream state um, because it, it just, you're already so disconnected to the movie in a sense that I don't really care what's going to happen to Bond. Um, I don't really care about any of the other characters. Um, you know, the whole Gustav Graves thing and the, the North Korean thing. And, you know, we have kind of touched on the, the whitewashing and, and stuff. And it is absolutely horrendous. And it does not age well at all. Uh, it's, it is definitely the worst thing about this movie is, you know, the whole whitewashing aspect of it. And obviously they certainly didn't think about that or they didn't put a great deal of thought about that in at the time. But I, I just feel as a whole that the James Bond movies are so well known for their stunts and their action sequences. Um, I mean, you can go back and um, you can look at the... Um, I can't, I, I'm just, I, I don't know what the movie is off the top of my head, but there's one with a really impressive car flip and it's completely practical. And, and basically it, it kind of, it's like one side of the bridge to the other and it, it basically flips the car. I don't know which movie that's from. It's from one of the earlier movies. Yeah, it's The Man with the Golden Gun, yeah. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so glad, I'm so happy that someone knows their Bond movies. But, you know, things like that. I mean, you I remember watching that. Like I say, it stuck with me. And it's one of those stunts that I just go, wow, that is incredible. And there's kind of something similar in this movie where you've got Zhao in one car and you've got Bond in another and they're kind of going over the ice and all of that's practical. And, you know, they froze a lake for it. Uh, they had to dam it. They had to get rid of the seawater so the water would freeze. I, You know, that's all pretty cool. I like that. And then obviously they're driving and then they're... <laughs> Because it's a Bond movie. You've got, obviously, all of these different uh, weapons on the cars. I get that. It's Bond. Okay. And Zhao fires a weapon at Bond and the car flips. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like, oh, okay, I can get in on this. If the car's going to flip over, what's Bond going to do? Yeah, yeah, I can get that. And then, obviously, the ejector seat thing happens and you go, okay, yeah, that, that's quite decent. That makes sense. He, you know, ejector seat out and flip the car back. But then you don't get anything else. It's just driving. Yeah. And I'm like, if I want to see two people driving, I'll, you know, go and have a look at what's happening on the M1. It's just, <laughs> that, that's genuinely how it feels. It doesn't feel exhilarating. It just feels like I'm watching two people drive on just what happens to be ice. And I think that just kind of sums up this movie for me. I think it's got so much potential there. I think you're absolutely right. It's got a terrible script. The direction isn't very good. Uh, the actors are trying with what they've got. Um, but obviously, most of these characters have very little personality or development. So when you look at this movie from a kind of general point of view, and you, you want a great action sequence, you want a Bond movie that you will remember. You know, you mentioned Xenia on a top from Goldeneye. I will always remember her because she literally crushed men with her thighs. And it's like, where is that moment in this movie? Where is that standout moment? And people will say, oh, well, it's, you know, when he's CGI surfing and, and all of that stuff. But no, because it's actually not very good. <laughs> or the um, frantic laser fight, which is echoing Goldfinger in the worst way possible. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That could be quite a decent fight. But it's so unmemorable. Like, you've just mentioned it now, and I've just thought, oh, yeah, that was in this movie. It's just too busy. Yeah. Yeah. It's just too busy. That fight's too busy. The The film is too busy. You think about the, the, the horrible, horrible, like, windsurfing on the tidal wave scene. It, it doesn't... It, it's... You know it's not, obviously, Pierce Brosnan. It's all CG. There's no stakes in the game, and you know Bond is going to survive, so you don't buy into it. You just check out and go, and then sit there looking at how bad the CG is, which makes you enjoy it even less. Yeah, and that's the thing. It has these moments that you, they kind of grate on you because you're like, oh, this is too over the top. But then, like, you'll get hit with a really terrible CG shot. I think of the sled going off the cliff and slamming against the wall. Um, the composites of him on the wave, or even at the end 
when they are in the helicopter going out the back of the plane. Oh, man. And, like, that helicopter, I mean, <laughs> it is, like, something out of a bargain basement movie of, like, two actors in front of a green screen basically pretending they're in a helicopter. <laughs> and it's never convincing. <laughs> like, it's, like, sequences like that. I don't... I can take bad CG if you hit me with it in a, you know, 2000s movie. But when you have sequences like that that are so bad and seem to defy physical gravity or and, you know, that sort of thing or physics, it just, it, it becomes that much more uncanny valley. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, it takes you out of a movie you've already been taken out of several times. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, okay. Before, I think before we wrap everything up, I want to just throw it out to everyone is there any final thoughts final questions i have one question that maybe i'll start us off with okay sure is this film in any way salvageable yes um <laughs> yeah uh i think it's a heavy uh heavy uh, job though because i think i would have made will yun lee the villain of the movie because i actually think he's really strong his introduction Absolutely. you know kick mm -hmm. kicking that punching bag with a guy inside like that's a threatening yeah. villain so I would keep him as the villain. I would build up North Korea as, um, you know, the obviously the uh, adversaries of the film. I think you can work in Jinx, but you've got to get rid of this space yeah. laser stuff, Gustav Graves. Because to me, that's where the movie falls apart is like once you head to that ice palace, it's the uh, it's the journey of no return. So I think you keep the torture stuff and you tie it more character based into has Bond been corrupted by, you know, North Korean yes. torture and yes, build from there absolutely 100 percent agree i think that would be such a fascinating movie you wouldn't know is james bond you know is james bond a double agent mm -hmm. i think that would be such a fascinating thing to go down i mean obviously he's james bond so by the end of the movie it'd be like no actually he was working for british intelligence this whole time ha 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 but that that would just be so fascinating to watch and yeah, basically all of what Cam just said. I want I want to see that die another day because hmm. I think that would be so much more interesting than what we unfortunately got. And I I agree Cam, I think that's the perfect thing to do. And I would even add to it by saying you would you could also have Jinx as this like paragon of virtue. She is a spy that's not corrupted. There are no question marks of Jinx. So the audience almost would side with her a little bit. Maybe you can have Bond do some questionable things, maybe kill some people. Well, you're set up perfectly because you have him basically having his license rescinded and going on his own little mission to Cuba there. And M is kind of just watching. And I think maybe the uh, Americans get wary of this agent kind of on the loose in, you know, kind of dabbling into sensitive areas and send Jinx representing the NSA to check him out. Like, what's going on? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I think that's a far more interesting film. I, I know that probably this is a bit before its time. And I know this is obviously something that... Um... No Time to Die is obviously going to go into with Lashana Lynch, but I really do feel like having a female 007 and, and maybe Halle Berry as, uh, I mean, I don't know if she, can she be a 007 if she's not British? I don't know. Is that, is that a rule? I don't know. Um, but anyway, <laughs> just, just asking out loud, but I would really like for uh, someone like Halle Berry to be given a really meaty role. And I, I really agree with the fact that what what Scott just said, that she could literally be the uh, the audience perspective. She, so we are kind of looking at this movie, looking at this James Bond person through her eyes. She has to figure out, is he telling the truth? You know, has he defected to the North Koreans? And obviously North Korea, I, by the way, I don't think North Korea has such uh, large waves on its beaches. I'm, I'm pretty certain <laughs> But I've, I've clearly never been to North Korea, by the way, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that they don't have that level of surf in that country. Um, but, you know, that whole North Korea aspect, if only they'd kind of stuck with that and, and yeah, like gone with a potentially rogue Bond. I think that would have been so interesting and it would have been something for Pierce Brosnan to get his teeth into as well, because obviously, historically, he's been quite open about how much he dislikes this movie. I think if he'd been given something decent to do, even if it was his final bond, then he would have actually enjoyed it because I don't think he really did. Hmm. Well, Brosnan has gone on the record several times during his tenure as Bond saying he wanted more character work. Yeah. Yeah. And less of the splashy stuff. So that would have been the perfect swan song exactly. for him. 
but unfortunately, he just gets to uh, sigh another day. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do. I do have another final thought as well, if if I may. Go for it. Go um, for it. Yeah. So I I did kind of allude to this earlier, but I really do think that despite the fact that die another day is is I mean it should it deserves to to die another death basically doesn't it Let's be honest. Hmm. But I really do feel like a lot of uh, I'm talking like general cinema goers. I'm not talking specifically about uh, James Bond fans uh, in general, but I certainly think that this movie is given is given a short shift unnecessarily um, because I think a lot of people will agree that what came after this with the Daniel Craig era of Bond um, is arguably one of the the best kind of cinematic Bonds um, that. You know, I think most people, I mean, I think it depends what Bond you're into. Some people do prefer a Connery. Some people prefer a Moore. Um, I mean, I, I am quite partial to Daniel Craig, but for many, many other reasons other than Bond. But I I think that the the legacy of this movie, of, of Die Another Day, I think if you look at what it did, yes, it made a lot of money. Yes, critics weren't especially keen on it. And, and yes, you look at it retrospectively and you say, well, you know, this actually, it could have been so good. And we've talked about how it could have been good. And it really could have. There's so much potential in this movie. It's so frustrating. But ultimately what it did do was it did herald in a brand new era for James Bond. And it is the era that we're currently in, the Daniel Craig era, the, you know, that's going to be culminating with No Time to Die. And I really do think we can't discount what Die Another Day actually did for this franchise. Because by being as bad as this is, it actually made Bond great again. And I wish I hadn't just said that, but you know, for, for reasons. <laughs> but um, it, it, it made James Bond a, a cool franchise. It made it an interesting franchise, a gritty franchise. And I, I don't think that that is remembered, uh, that Die Another Day is remembered enough for that, but it should be. Because the legacy of this movie is the Daniel Craig era of Bond. Yeah, and that's something the Bond franchise has always done. It's built itself up too big and then pulled back into interesting ways. You know, you look at Moonraker, leads them pulling back into Free Your Eyes Only and saying, hey, let's strip this back down. It's getting kind of crazy. So they've done this in the past. So, like, yeah, I think that this is a very interesting pivot point in the franchise. That's why, like, I can never hate it because I feel like the ongoing story of the Bond franchise is compelling unto itself. And this movie is just a chapter in that. Um, I have a couple of notes. I'll just make a couple quick ones. Uh, one funny and then just a, a separate one. Um, so there's a moment where they're showing the Icarus satellite and the room is like blinding light, right? And everyone has these black sunglasses on except for Bond and Jinx. And I'm like, I feel like these two would be blind after this scene. Like they should be bumping into furniture. <laughs> um, so... That's one thing. The other uh, moment that I was kind of like chuckling to myself, the whole like genetic um, clinic they go to, I like the idea. It's kind of goofy. It has a sci-fi vibe. There's some really cool Peter Lamont um, art direction going on here with like the mirrored room and everything. But a couple points I want to bring up. Number one, the doctor who's like looking at Jinx, you know, Halle Berry being like, hmm, a lot of work needed here. Um, yeah, this is going to be painful. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? Is this supposed to be a joke? <laughs> Yeah, not quite sure what that doctor was smoking. Yeah, no kidding. Maybe he'd been staring into the Icarus light as well. Um, <laughs> the other point is the whole Zhao bit with, like, the diamonds in the face and going through this procedure halfway. You know, I, I kind of like the whole giving the henchman kind of a vibe. It's weird. But did any of you notice on the screen what Zhao, the final result, was supposed to be? Uh, oh, what, after the transformation? Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I, I, I saw it, but didn't, I couldn't make it out. It looked like Devin Sawa. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't pick that up. I was just like, oh, generic white dude. <laughs> well, that's Devin Sawa, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the, the, it does kind of bring about some of the, the best lines. And, and it, one, of, one thing this movie does have going for it is the lines are incredibly cheesy. Um, and they, do, they did make me laugh out loud on several occasions. And one of the ones that always uh, gets me is when James Bond um, sees Zhao and he's obviously got the diamonds in his face and he says, uh, you know, I've missed your sparkling personality. <laughs> it's just <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous script. Absolutely ridiculous. 
if you're a filmmaker, don't put these lines in your script, but they they do make people laugh. <laughs> they are ridiculous. Um, but yeah, generic white, I mean, you know, who doesn't want to be a generic white dude as I'm talking to two white dudes? <laughs> Who are very generic. I, well, I didn't I, I didn't say generic. <laughs> You're both exceptional white dudes. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. <laughs> I I probably will just shout out, uh, and Cam, you're right. Peter Lamont's work in this film is great. I'd say the, yeah. the sets are terrific. The art direction is terrific. It, it probably just, it just gets forgotten under the rest of the noise. Yeah. But uh, that's definitely there, and I think the uh, David Arnold score again is is maybe not his strongest one of the Bonds, but it's a good one. The Cuban theme is great when he does the James Bond theme in Cuba. I thought that was fantastic. I'm going to download that. Sorry, I had a, one question about the Peter Lamont sets, though, kind of tied to that. Maybe you guys can answer this. Sure. So we set up at the Ice Palace that there is a diamond mine next door, right? Like that's that whole subterranean, you know, jungly kind of thing. But when they capture Jinx, I believe. Um, they actually say the, the mine is fake, but the lasers are real. Why is there a fake mine? Why are there real lasers? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. Like, <laughs> what is the purpose well, of this? Maybe it was something, because obviously this is in Iceland, oh. isn't it? This is this. I know. So maybe it's something to do with, obviously, Iceland is quite close to the North Pole and therefore you've got more access to the sun in summer. And so, therefore, the Icarus can see more of the sun? I don't know. Am I just making up science? I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Okay, Scott. So, this is just a pitch. I think I picked this up from my two watches of this film, though. So, here we go. At the beginning of the film, you've obviously got um, a Colonel Moon, and he's dealing in diamonds. And these are blood diamonds from South Africa. Okay. But um, they need a way of, of sort of getting them out. But obviously the plot is foiled. And then we have the whole transformation into Gustav Graves. Now, when Bond is on the plane, incidentally, uh, Roger Moore's daughter, I believe, is on the plane. It's one of the British Airways stewards. Okay. Um, he's looking at a magazine with Gustav Graves saying, like, the King of Diamonds Yeah. on the front. So my suggestion is he's obtaining these diamonds illegally because they're blood diamonds and they, people can't trade in those and then using his fake mine as a front of that's where he got the diamonds from oh which has allowed him to make the well i get it to do what he wanted to do maybe then that ties into what i'm saying about iceland though because otherwise why would you why wouldn't you just have a fake mine somewhere else yeah i'd say that's probably right with the laser beam stuff with the you know and clear skies and things like that that's that's probably the other part of it too yeah, I just want to validate what I said because I think your suggestion's much better. But <laughs> we fleshed each other's out. It's yeah. fine. It was all good. I, I, I think good. both of us together. I think what we've said makes perfect sense. And with Cam's script revisions, we've built a good film. Sure. I think we've built an excellent film. I'm actually quite sad that we'll never see it. <laughs> all right. It sounds like we've broken down Die Another Day into its. Small little diamond pieces, but I think now we have to look at the ultimate question of did Die Another Day make the knock list? Now, of course, Goldeneye made it on. Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough did not. So this is Brosnan's last chance to have a second entry on the knock list. Now, Em, you're our guest. You go first. Is Die Another Day making the knock list? I can actually give you a one word answer to this. <laughs> My first time ever. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I think the movie that we've made collectively together, I think would <laughs> make the knock list. Because I think our movie sounds awesome. But this one, no. Just no. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. You haven't got to justify it. Cam, what about you? Yeah, it's a big no for me. Um this movie is more interesting historically, maybe more so than like Tomorrow Never Dies, a movie we enjoyed much more. Um, mm. Die Another Day, as M has pointed out, is crucial to the direction of this franchise. But as an actual experience, sitting to watch it for two hours, it's just really frustrating. It's not a movie, as I've said, that I hate. You know, it's kind of like a two star movie for me where there's bits I enjoy, but there's a lot of frustrations that come with it. And, uh, you know, it's part of the Bond canon, and it's a very faulty part of the Bond canon, but I kind of appreciate it nonetheless for just existing. 
So it's a no for me, and uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully our next Bond film we tackle is a uh, in. Hopefully so. Well, um, as per when we have one guest, we've had two no's, so my vote is again pointless, but I'll throw it out there anyway. It's obvious I didn't enjoy this film. It's going to be a no on the knock list. I appreciate Cam's angle of it being somewhat of a touchstone in Bond history. And of course, it's got Pierce Brosnan in it. I love Pierce Brosnan. I'm part of hashtag Team Brosa. You know, that's 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 the guy I stan. But I can't do anything to stand this film. It, I can't stand this film. <laughs> and so it is not making the knock list for me. Well, there we have it. Sorry, Pierce. And I don't, I don't even feel bad about it. <laughs> no, no, nor do I. I, I. Um, I, just, I have. To, yeah, don't feel bad. I feel obliged to ask a question, Cam, and I know I'm not supposed to ask this every time, mm. but for me, this was an absolute stinker and quite possibly the worst of the twenty-five. Yes. <laughs> Is this film? Could this film potentially make the disavowed list? I don't think so. I think there's too many elements that are really strong in it that I enjoy. I shouldn't say really strong, but that are interesting to me. I was going to say. Yeah, uh, <laughs> something I'm going to really to bat. I didn't talk a lot about Zhao, but Zhao completely saved this entire movie for it. I love it. I changed my mind. Put it on the knock list. No. Um, uh, no, it's... To me, like, this isn't, like, grimly bad. Like, this is just really mediocre. And there's so many worse movies out there. Like, there are horrible movies. Like, this year... Um, you know, 2002, you had a movie like Ballistic X vs. Sever. That's not even comparable to, like, a Die Another Day. Die Another Day is just really mediocre. It's just within the Bond canon. It definitely lands pretty close to the bottom, if not the bottom. Okay. I thought it was worth asking. Fair. You're not, you're not alone, Scott. I'm sure a lot of people actually would like you to ask that question. Yeah, I, I, I think if I were to write the Bond films out and actually rank them, which I've never really done, I have a feeling Die Another Day would be bottom or, if not, tied. For last place yeah but we won't dig into that for now however dying of the day has received three no's and as such the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified now cam before we talk about what we're doing next week firstly i want to thank m for joining us <laughs> the <you> aptly <laughs> named m by the way yeah. the aptly named which we haven't mentioned no we've not, um, we've not even talked about that well i kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier i don't know if you're going to cut that out by the way but <laughs> feel free to cut out as much of me as you'd like <laughs> all uh, of your stuff's gone just the intro and the outro yeah. basically that's it yeah she's she's not even guesting on this episode it's literally just scott and cam <laughs> anyway sorry carry on what were you saying well, I just wanted to thank you for joining oh, us. I mean, you're you know, we've had this one in the works for some time, and yes. it was really, it was, you know, it was interesting to have a perspective that's outside the Bond bubble, which is where we tend to exist sometimes. And you know, we might be uh, less severe on things because we have like, oh well, we saw the world is not enough a few months ago, and at least blah blah blah. Like we could connect it and maybe let things go, or maybe we're too harsh on stuff. So it was nice to have an outside perspective and that uh, that agrees with us. We always appreciate people that agree with us. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be completely honest. Uh, I didn't agree with uh, your complete assessment on Charlie's Angels uh, not going on the knock list oh. because hmm. to me, I mean, uh, perfection. Uh, I, it's not something I throw around very often, but um, and I'm I'm genuinely fascinated to hear what you think of Atomic Blonde because I genuinely do think that is one of the best spy movies ever so genuinely quite fascinated i'm actually a big fan of that film i am a big fan of that film so i am looking forward to tackling it at some point mm -hmm. cool for sure well thank you so much for having me like, like you said it has been a long time we talked about this such a long time ago and and literally it is all my fault <laughs> because uh yeah my my schedule is is a little bit brutal um but i i'm genuinely so delighted to be here and i've had such a wonderful time with both of you it's it's been so cool even though the movie is not fantastic um i i think that i think we've found redeeming things and i think i've been fair and objective so but also positive so i'm happy about that good good i, I disagree i think you've been very harsh and very disrespectful <laughs> to the legacy of bond we'll never have yeah. you back. oh well, that's um, harsh <laughs> I, I, you know, I, you've been great. And again, thank you for joining us. Now, um, Em, tell the listeners where they can find more from you. Right. Well, I mean, obviously, 
as I said, thank you so much for having me. Um, I can be found uh, at the podcast Verbal Diorama. Uh, as I said, it's the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. Uh, I have covered a, a, a brief sprinkling of spy movies, um, but I, I like to cover all sorts of different things. Um, so hopefully if someone's listening to this and they don't find me completely annoying, then they can check out my podcast. I do host my podcast solo. So it's always very strange to recommend my podcast when I'm talking to other people because it's very difficult to talk like this on a solo podcast because you obviously don't have anyone to talk to. So <laughs> so I'm not quite this vivacious <laughs> on my on my podcast. I'm just genuinely so excited to to be here. That's why I'm, you know, so excitable and happy all the time. Bouncing off the wall. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We had to calm you down. We spent 20 <laughs> minutes calming you down before we started. Yeah, Hyperventilating, it was, it was intense. I know, well, that, that's what you guys do to me. So, um, yeah, if anyone is interested in listening to Verbal Diorama, I would be absolutely delighted if you could come and join me on my little podcasting journey. Um, so, yeah, you can find me, uh, well, the website is verbaldiorama.com. Um, you can find, obviously, all of the episodes on there. But, you know, it's Verbal Diorama and your podcast app of choice. Or you can find me on social media uh, at Verbal Diorama on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. And yeah, come and say hi to me. Um, I'm always happy to speak. I don't mean you two. You two don't ever speak to me again. Um, but <laughs> everyone, everyone else listening uh, is, you know, I'm more than happy to speak to anyone about pretty much anything, uh, especially, especially uh, the mummy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not die another day. Um, or Keanu Reeves. Or Keanu Reeves, yes, absolutely. Talk to me about Keanu Reeves. We have mentioned him, so he will be happy. I'll let him know. I'll call him later and let him know. He'll be very happy that we've uh, we've spoken about him. Yeah, well, I mean, it was an absolute thrill to have you join us. And, you know, I would always recommend Verbal Diorama to anyone that likes films, period. For sure. You know, I, I love the way you, you actually dissect them and you get some, you know, much like we do in the sense of having some background on the films as well. That's what I like from a podcast personally. And that's why I, I, I gravitated towards yours. And of course, you have the best theme tune in the game. I mean, someone did say to me recently that it was second best. And I was a little bit like, what? Are you joking? Um, second best? Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I've been tempted several times to crack out my guitar and record like a, a grunge version of it and kind of like the uh, like a Nirvana or a Pearl Jam style. Not that you'd ever have to play it, but just so I could say it, sing it out loud, really, because it's a really catchy tune. Do it. <laughs> yeah, all right. Do it. If, you, if, if that will make you happy, um, then I was going to start singing some Cheryl Crow, but I'm not going to start singing Cheryl Crow. Didn't we she... don't allow Cheryl Crow on this podcast. No, 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 no. she no. do... Which theme song did she do? Tomorrow Never Dies. The world is no Tomorrow Never Dies, yes. I do. Yeah, The World Is Not Enough was Garbage. Garbage are a fantastic Correct. band. Love Garbage. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it's a shame Garbage didn't do the theme song for Dying of the Day. <laughs> yeah. Well, can't win um, them all. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> this film certainly can't. <laughs> um, Cam, what are we doing next week? We are tackling the 1939 spy film the Spy in Black, directed by Michael Powell. I think this is going to be a really interesting one. It stars Conrad Veet. So, um, yeah, this is going to be, I think, something really interesting, maybe a little noirish. I haven't seen it. I'm looking forward to it. I've heard some good things about it, actually. A lot of people I speak to in terms of classic cinema are big fans. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch The Spy in Black and join us next week. You can, of course, follow us discreetly at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, we are a proud member of Quite The Thing Media Network, and you can find out more about them on quitethethingmedia.com. But until next week, listeners, don't pull it out. I'm not finished with it yet. <laughs> <laughs>